Howdy, howdy. Uh, we are gathered here today to enter the Dim Zoom. Um, I'm here with Freighter Perseus, my cohort and partner within this uh, new hyper sigil, haunt sigil, uh, incredible audio sigil that we just created. And I thought, we both thought we could take this time to really dive into the creation, the praxis of our disparate works within creating such a beast, but also share in the pride of how uh, whiplash, how creative, how quick it was to construct something, especially from two magicians and creatives and two transcontinental or transcontinentally disparate places. Um, and you can too, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, uh, we birthed it on Sunday. And yeah, how are you feeling? Uh, I've, that was a crazy day in general. You know, that was a, there was a lot of things happening that day. But yeah, I actually woke up on time to uh, actually see it, you know, at, at the election time, get out at the election time like we had talked about, um, which we'll talk about later too. But um, I feel good about it. I feel actually the more and more I listen to it, especially the uh, the visualizer, like that just sounds really good. I don't know if that's how the raw files sound or if there is some kind of thing YouTube does to it, but they sound, I've been, I just downloaded the visualizer onto my YouTube account and I just was like walking around last night listening to it. And man, it's just, we did something really cool. Like it, it, it gets me out of my technical drum mindset that I'm stuck in a lot of the times. Like I got to learn a new chop. I got to get super tight at this. I got to be, you know, this part has to be technical, but it also has to be, you know, you know, beautiful audio, you know, like it has to be <laughs> just perfect. So like, rather than worrying about that, I just, with this project, it's not that I played at a lesser quality or anything like that. It's just that I wasn't obsessed with how my parts were going to play into the whole. I was more interested in how you, what you were going to add to them. And I feel like you probably had the opposite where you're like, wow, these things are really cool. I don't usually have beats like this to work with so it inspired you so i think it was cool it kind of took our virgo-ness out of the picture mm -hmm. a lot that, that didn't get in the way as much as it would have you know yeah it was a good confluence of like the virgo rising to the virgo sun and like how you know i i'm a bit fast and loose uh i think in the creative praxis as a whole but at the same time, when it came time to, you know, uh, really dive into the sonicness of the thing and mixing and and mastering and stuff, that's where the Virgo stuff could get a little in the way, but at the same time, beneficial, you know. And whereas you you started with that kind of um, well-performed, you know, well-executed polyrhythmic, you know, drum uh, recordings. But I guess we should talk about like, yeah, how what the genesis of the project was and how, you know, our ethos kind of developed into what we want to do with this project, let alone kind of our disparate magical stuff that we put into it. Um, and I think it really does come down to your rhythms are the genesis or the birth of, of each of these, you know, tracks or this, this whole project as a whole. And, you know, we decided that that was, gonna be kind of not an absolute but definitely a maxim in creating this thing that to keep me away from my known trickery or wizardry and to really like exemplify <laughs> an experimental nature like i needed to allow you to do what you do best and that was you know create the uh the bones and the rhythm yeah man and i I appreciate that. And for multiple reasons, one, because when you're in the creative space, you don't want somebody, not that you would nitpick or be over critical. You just don't want somebody over your shoulder. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And that has to do just in general, that has nothing to do with you specifically, but I do love that. And I also appreciate the fact that it's like, okay, dude, normally you write drum parts to, already written melodies you know so now it's like what are you going to come up with how do you make a drum part melodic but not overplay how do you kind of structure things without knowing 
where it's going to go. That's why I was amazed at how it sounds be, and what you did on your end, because I mean, I mean that honestly, like not in a over congratulatory way, but I'm just really stoked that it sounds so cohesive after you added your parts that it sounds like we wrote them at the same time in the same place, which they were not. Yeah. And I think that's where the magic lies because this was uh foreign to me. Um, I know we've discussed this, that I think we both were in our spaces as creators or magicians. And I had just gone through the gamut of really kind of excising any hopes to play with somebody else or to create with somebody else on that level. And I, uh, you know, outside of, you know, Eric Millar or some other folks uh, doing creative projects with, I just wasn't, I didn't think a, a, a band dynamic was in the future unless it was, you know, me backing up Mary on the moon division stuff or vice versa, you know? So there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any, like intention to create this thing and it, i think that's what was beautiful about okay yeah uh you play i love your drums you know you post your you're a long story teacher um and you post these really wonderful you know videos of you playing on instagram and after we got uh introduced to each other you know it was very much like what are we doing we should you know at least attempt something and i think my uh you know, my mode and method was like, hey, I have I have these songs already. Let's see what you can do with them. And I think that we realized real quick that, no, if this is going to work, it's got to be a very much like, uh, you know, a creative catharsis thing from the ground up. It can't be like, hey, play drums on this thing I've already made, we, which, mm. you know, there's room for that in the future. But for this specifically, it really needed to be uh the beauty of halves you know and mm. it started with your drumming and then you know we should talk about how you captured your drums and what that process was like <laughs> yeah well uh i'm actually um, this has to do with how amazed i am with the sound of the drums on the album i mean you know it's it's kind of insane because i use a little tascam recorder which i have in here somewhere i don't know i think it's over there by my by my uh shelf over there but it's a two microphone like two condenser mic tascam it's not a super cheap little one but it's like a three or four hundred dollar device and yeah uh i just set that up on a tripod that i had bought we used to use it the reason i even have that thing is because we had one years ago in a band that i was in and we used that to record demos and then that one broke and we gave it a viking funeral literally and then we um bought another one we bought the updated one and we used that for uh for practice recordings and demos and stuff and then the band broke up and i fell into possession of it because bass player doesn't record anything and then our only guitar player has a whole home studio set up so he didn't need it so i was like hell yeah i will definitely take this and after years of you know i'm familiar with it so after years of knowing how to use it at least a little bit cursory um i was able to find a place in my in this room in the mauve room even though it's not so mauve right now mm -hmm. um to find the exact right way if you can see these are black sound blankets behind me this pads my entire uh what would be my living room in my house it's a really small house so this has become like the creative laboratory and um so it's already sound treated and then we, we use the task cam or i did in a special spot right over here to tweak it, found exactly where it picked up the kick, the toms, the tone, the cymbals weren't too brash. I know there is a little bit, but also my cymbal choice is brash in a couple ways. So it's hard to get that completely out of the mix. But yeah, basically long story short, very simple device, very simple placement. And uh, the drums were done that way. Yeah. And what I love about this was, you know, as somebody that, drums myself but you know we'll also mic a kit to high heaven because i can and get lost in that process like you lose the um durability of the performance aspect the more you're putting into the process of of recording or capturing so just starting by like the genealogy of i'm just going to capture the room as best i can of what 
of just my simple performance is like per- perfectly encapsulates what this project should be. And it's like those limitations were, you know, freedom inducing. And, you know, I made sure to keep that in mind when, you know, you sent me the tracks was that anything that I put on top of it, I had to be able to replicate live. Like, or it would be, if it was a guitar playing, uh, you know, my baritone guitar, it would be done in a take as sloppy as it might be as, you know, um, you know, crunchy or uh, unwieldy in the mixing and mastering processes. It might be like, it had to share that genealogy. And I think what I, what I was really excited about that was, you know, I've been working a lot again with four tracking and there is that, um, accountability with cassette tape or, or any of these kind of recording processes where you can't hide behind a lot of post production. It like it loses all of its momentum and, and fervor, you know, if the performance isn't good first and foremost. And good, you know, in your case, good, right? In my case, like whatever serviceable to <laughs> whatever we're trying to make. Um I think but you know good. what I mean? So I think like it was really good. <laughs> but like it was it it definitely shared in that construct and that was you know, built from your, maybe, I don't want to say limitations, uh, but something akin to that in the realm of recording, right? Using a simple Tascam, you know, XY mic, single recorder, you know, just capturing the Move room and then having that be the antenna or having that dispatch over here to the dimming room where I have my own setup and I'll be a bit more, you know, uh, equipped with like recording techniques. Mm-hmm. It was great to, you know, remember like that ethos of let's, you know, let's limit the idea of multi-tracking or like, just cause we have the tools doesn't mean we need to use them, you know? Right. So it was yeah. always going back to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. That was one of the things that made it fun was I was just recording things that I, thought were cool or interesting or moved me in some way i mean they're just rhythms at some point but i mean to break them down to just rhythms is also taken away from the fact that i had to get into a meditative state a little bit to get into those you know it wasn't just sit down and play something you know that and that was telling you last time we talked you know when i would do that i'm like okay this is a cool beat this is like technical like my my mind started to get in, in the way that i would mess it up i'd mess it up i'd mess it up and like I don't have what you have. I don't have this computer that I can just like, whoop, all right, delete, play again, up, delete, play again. I have to physically get up and walk around, stop it, restart it, sit back down and start playing again. And I would just, (laughs) with, I would fuck up within like the first two beats. I'm like, yep, shit, you know? So it's like, it required a lot of focus and I don't know. I, it would have been different, you know, I would have been different had I had the ease of mm. your your setup and i'm not saying what you did was easy but i'm saying like having all the gear and have everything set up and have the daw running and have everything like sure that that's awesome and i love that but like i taught t- i always say this i'm a you know i'm a primitive uh being who just hits things you know like i'm not stupid but i i just i don't like to have wires in the way of that as much as possible even though i do yeah. want to understand i would love to record myself and i kick myself all the fucking time for not learning that and getting those things so i'm glad you kept you you know even though you have the ability you kept that in mind like one we have to be able to reproduce this live i mean you were definitely a big proponent of that from the beginning you know Mm -hmm. so i and i and i stuck with that too because i don't want to play things in multi-layer things that i can't play live because we we want to do this live eventually yeah and it's uh it just you know it calls back to that ethos of it and it's also a confluence of what i've been feeling pretty remarkably as of late and even my own stuff i mean all of this accoutrement it was always in service to the song right it was it's always here for a solo person like me to be able to drum with my own compositions or lay down bass with my own compositions and i think at the advent of this whatever this you know digital age is where it's getting so easy to lose that somatic sensibility of like capturing the room of even miking shit, you know, it's like people don't really do that anymore. They'll, they'll be reticent to just record at the computer, but I'm the same way. Like I have, you know, a drum station back there, there's my amps over there and I'm the same where 
even though the interface is here, I'll have to walk all the way back over here to stop and restart the recording. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I need to be in that space for the guitar. It has to capture the amp and the mic. And like, I really didn't use many effects or pedals really either, you know, outside of like a delay or echo, but all that fuzz is just the analog tube fuzz from my amp, you know? Um, just with the gain, the master, the the special, you know, uh, Yamaha old school, you know, JX VCD or whatever bass amp that I play through. Like it was, it all had to be encapsulated in the room. It's kind of like pra practical effects, right? You, you don't want to just green screen everything. You don't want to like just rely on putting it in posts. Like you want to, you want to capture in camera. And I think that's what we both did, whether it was the dimming room here in Washington or it was the Mauve room there in Illinois, you know? And mm. I think that's what makes it sound like it's in the same room. Like you can't, um, I really don't think you can cheat that stuff. You know what I mean? No, you know, and two things come to mind hearing what you just said. One is you're saying, you know, modern pe modern uh, musicians or modern music producers don't want to put real drums in. And it's like, yeah, because miking a real drum kit and getting it to sound good is a bitch. Like, it's yeah. not fun. It's not easy. And of course, you just like, let's just throw it in Pro Tools or let's just throw, you know, mm -hmm. drum whatever whatever the whatever it's called drum drum again or whatever one of these fucking drum programs is over the top and just or just have them play it sound like shit and then just quantize everything yeah you know, like that that's so much, it's so yeah. stupid it, it's just it's it's it worked for a minute i guess for people in production i get why it's like the utilitarian mind likes that but josh eppard who's the drummer from coed and cambria who is probably one of my favorite drummers whose style has leaked into my style, even though you can't really tell all the time. He said something very interesting when they recorded one of their more recent records. He said, you know, he was saying how like I play hard. I mean, this is, you know, this is paraphrased. Like I play really hard and I put my soul into these parts. And when, you know, you can hear that through the microphones. And I agree with that. I agree with that hundred percent. You can tell uh, there's an energy that comes through, especially on drums. I mean, it comes on every, every single instrument but i do believe it happens on drums as well and you can hear when somebody means something like when somebody sings a line we've all heard singers who can hit the note and they can hit a note perfectly but it doesn't move you and when somebody right. hits a note that's a little more rough and it's the say it's, it's the note but it's not as beautifully pristine and they they're trying to say something with their voice when they hit that note that you get the chills you know like that and that's the difference is like you can just like you can hear that you can tell when I hit something on the drums that I, I meant what I was playing. And I think that yeah. comes through. And you can't, like you said, you can't replicate that. So No, you can't. And it's like uh, what we talked about before, too. Just uh, how in deeply intentional and magical the resonance is that, you know, the documentation of it, of not only you in the room, but your physiology in the room of, you know, your breathing, your, you know, your fingertips, your calluses, how you're touching the, the things like, you know, it, it's just that beautiful document. And I can't, uh, I can't share enough how important it is to capture the room, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, speaking of, you know, the Mauve room and the dimming room, we learned pretty early on that these were kind of antennas, you know, that were kind of, constructing you know this mauve zone or this like this dim desert you know between us um and it was like naturally folkloric in a way like these you know even lyrically all of the lyrics heard on the album if they're not just the channeled like quick demos i did anyway um even the refined lyrics come from just channeled lyrics of me just getting ideas down. And I think there is like a purity to that too. It's like, I can sit here and be, you know, the pretentious wordsmith that, you know, I want to be <laughs> a lot of the time, but it was also, you know, part and parcel to be like very, like, even if it, it was capturing the feeling and something that was like truly connecting with the music rather than pondering it way too deeply or too hard you know uh-huh yeah no you definitely 
Man, I was listening to Last and Low last night, and uh, we'll get into the tracks in a, in a little bit here. But I was listening to Last and Low, and like the the actual part where you say that Last and Low, what a sight to behold! Like that is a uh, like the way that you bend that note and the way that you say that, and even the little. I think what really drove that point home for me was the little uh, promo demo you made for that song, where it goes onto the the picture, you know, the drone footage of you. And you're smiling. Oh, yeah. The yeah. one little clip where it catches you smiling is actually very eerie with that music behind it. Mm-hmm. And just it it drove something emotionally in me for some reason, even though it's a funny little clip. It's cool. I love it. I think it's I think they're great. But I just even though it's just like a little clip we used to promote it on Instagram or whatever, like that was artistic in itself. And then I started listening to the lyrics. And what's funny, mo- some people might not not know this, but I didn't even know the lyrics until you put them on the man camp and I could look at them really. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> so I'm playing on the stuff and like getting emotionally and spiritually attached to all these songs. And like, I'm not even sure what you're saying or talking about. So, yeah. And I was kind of reticent to put them on the band camp, to be honest. And maybe there's still a little regret in doing that because I, I really love the idea of keeping them open for interpretation because I'm just as, you know, wanting to interpret them myself because they really were like, uh, you know, speaking of getting in the, the, the movement or the process, like my own audio Mancy praxis is very much that there's a lot of, um, ritualization and it wasn't different. Um, other than, you know, I had your drumming kind of on loop while I, you know, dimmed, the outside world and just got into it and just was repeatedly, I had it just tracking everything all the time until it just felt right. And I could just keep whatever I played last, you know? So it really was like this meditative thing with the guitar and I would be humming these words out loud. And it was the same with vocals where, you know, through a kind of a ritualistic praxis of, getting rid of the outside world, you know, I would sit there and basically meditate it and chant and have these like mutant melodies or whatever. And I knew that the, you know, what we call like the lyrical spaghetti, like I'm a firm believer in that as a tactic, but I'm also a firm believer in uh, like interpreting those lyrics instead of just utilizing the melody like what was i actually saying like what did it inspire to say you know whether or not it makes a resolute sense or not and that's what it was you know there might be some refining and pronunciation but like those lyrics were kind of always there right Hmm. yeah i mean your process definitely was unknown to me when we started and i understood that after a couple times sending you something that was a demo and then it came back as a final thing and i i wasn't pissed about that i thought it was great Callie's a great example of that but yeah um especially as the genesis of the project i remember that day i remember being like oh my god like especially once i heard the the lead at the end and that that awesome style of guitar that i love that you play um i was like well this is leading somewhere but you know it's just um almost i lost my point there but needless to say man like we are creating a third space between us. You know, I think that's kind of what we were talking about is like the fact that the room and the process on each side of this transcontinental thing is coalescing and it's working together, you know? And I think that that's um, pretty amazing in itself. And I love, I love that. Like, I, I, I love that. Like to me, it's so, uncommon it's so Mm -hmm. uncommon and it's so like you said it lends itself to folklore which you and i think are whether we know it or not i mean you know it but i mean i'm definitely more into that too for sure like i love that and looking at your life through your own lore you maybe remember how much i love that about life like listen Mm -hmm. reading your stuff too so yeah the process has been crazy it's been very interesting I think, you know, and just to touch on, you know, Cali, I think being the first, and we should play that here in a second, uh, because it really is the progenitor of all of this. And even though, 
you know, you sent it to me as a demo. I always sent them back as demos too. It wasn't ever the intention of like, oh, here's a finalized thing. Like, it's funny going back and actually doing a proper mix on a lot of them. I could tell it was just like a, here, check this out. This is kind of, you know, what came out of me. But it was also, you know, part of the ethos to be like, oh, shit. But at the same time, these deserve to live, you know, in a in a world of their own making and to not have like to get out of this refine culture that like so many artists and like current creators are into where it's just like everything has to be perfect every t has to be you know i was gonna say every t has to be dotted which is a great Uh example of what i mean you know like every t has to be dotted Uh, every i has to be crossed you know and like that's the thing it's i i want to escape from that and utilizing this digital space you know between us um with that sort of ethos and toe i think is like a perfect example of how how to fight against that kind of digital monoculture of like everything simple, simplified or refined for no reason and still utilizing it as a tool, right? Utilizing it's, it's amazing to me that, you know, uh, it's a rarity for like two musicians to, to work like this, this day and age, um, when it it shouldn't be it should be like a, a perfectly used tool and bridge and you can still have analog performance heavy true in the room feeling you know without it being truly in the room which is would be the ultimate goal but i think as like as two pragmatic jobbing you know workers artists like anyone can do this and still like in, inspire some like fervor and health and human error and excitement into, you know, the childlike wonder of creating a musical project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've had the most fun I've had in years doing this. And, um, that that's one of the reasons I continued with it was because, uh, I haven't had this much fun being creative and making music in a long time, especially after my last project that I had was in for and many iterations for you know, the better part of two decades had fallen apart. And, you know, I put so much into that and I just, I learned from that though. You know, I think we go through things and we learn yeah, not things in the future, you know? And like you're saying, I think the internet and digital, you know, audio workstations and all this technology you and I utilize to do this is just the plumbing. It's right. just, just the, how do I get my song, my, my track to Keats in Seattle from Illinois? How do I get it there? Well, I just send it through drive. Like mm-hmm. we weren't like, let's, let's utilize all these different tools to add on layers and layers and layers of complexity. We just used it to just make it possible. You know, yeah. that's it. That's all we did. I think that's the point you're trying to make is not over digitalizing and not over complicating and not, over refining and making it perfect letting it be what it's going to be trying to do a great performance obviously not just like whatever shit comes out of my mouth i'm going to keep but at the same time like or whatever whatever bullshit i end up hitting is is going to be the thing but also not getting too much in the way and letting like i said before the sausage make itself a little bit you know yeah and especially like you know that two people anywhere in the world uh with a laptop can do this you know a laptop each like I think that was the beauty of it. It just reminded me, it's like, just because, you know, we can doesn't mean we should. And we probably shouldn't because we don't need to with a lot of, (laughs) you know, the elements. And, you know, your drums pretty much remain the same. It's not like I did a lot of post-production things. It was just just standard, you know, mixing on a lot of the drums. And so, yeah, just keeping to that ethos.
Yeah, so there we are. Cali 333, which uh, another good, um, I mean, I think this is a prime example of what we were talking about because this really is just guitar, vocals, drums. That's it. Um, right. And uh, also the, not only the genesis of the drums, but kind of the like idea, maybe a thematic idea because of what you name songs or what we you know, discuss that end up being named a drum track that you send me. Um, and this one was Kali Yuga, correct? Yeah, it started off, I posted a video, which is still on my Instagram, called uh, Kali Yuga Kabbalah. And it's just, I like taking a color and I like taking esoteric ideas and terminology that are like, you know, what is that, onomatopoeia or whatever, where it's like the same letter or whatever that is. Um, so like Kali K and then Kabbalah. So I thought that was really cool. And then oh, I, alliteration. Uh, yeah. Alliteration. That's what I mean. Not onomatopoeia. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. Shows my knowledge of that. Um, yeah, that's the <laughs> word of sounds, you know, like pow, boom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that yeah, also works. <laughs> well, I, I get those confused. But anyway, yeah, I was yeah. at the grocery, I was at the grocery store and I posted that earlier that day and I was buying whatever groceries and I sent you uh, a, a message and I said, Hey, would you want to use this for uh, one of the songs? Cause we had just started talking about jamming and you were like, fuck yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, that's how it started. It was just, yeah. Kali Yuga. And I, I've had a lot of ideas about that. You know, the whole concept of the Kali Yuga lately, it's been seeping into my reality. So it kind of just uh, came through that, uh, you know, portal. Yeah. And like, that was my, my take on it because I did, you know, I received that transmission through the drumming and the syncopation itself. It, it very much is like a, you know, call to arms, like the, the gates of a whirlwind kind of opening, you know? And uh, to me, it was almost like um, not taking pleasure in, but kind of fortifying that, yes, we are in a Kali Yuga and that we do need to, synchronize maybe with Karanzan, the serpent of chaos and that maybe communing with it is better than fearing it and that's what turned into Kali 333 333 being uh, the number of Karanzan and thus like the lyrical kind of stuff just was born out of that and it also shares you know with my recent work with Bobby Hale and listening post alpha and you know, that numerology or that ALW cipher stuff. So that's all in there too, uh, without trying. Just a perfect document of where I was when you sent me this thing and where you were when you sent me this thing, you know. Um, yeah, so I think it's just a, it's a beautiful communion. And one funny anecdote about this song in particular is when it came time to mixing and mastering the whole I had given a try, I don't know, eight times to kind of remix this song or fix little bits there and got way too involved with that process to where it started kind of devaluing how beautiful and rugged like that initial communion was that we ended up just using the very first demo pretty much. Um, of the whole thing and it's not unlike all the other songs really we always kind of went back to its initial you know when things clicked for each of the songs in a way mm -hmm. but yeah yeah we we definitely did and Callie's a great example of um hearing and like you're talking about other artists picking up on this and doing things you know at disparate places or at disparate times or whatever you know coming together like we didn't know anything was going to work between us. We were just like, Hey, let's, I remember saying to you, like we were talking about the astrology stuff and I was like, Hey man, at some point in the next year, it would be cool to like do an audio thing sigil together or whatever. You know what I mean? So, and then you hit yeah. me up about it and we didn't know it was going to work at all. You know, it was just kind of like, Hey, let's try to do this and let's see if, if we can make something happen. And then you came back to that and I knew we had something, you know, I knew something was there. And I think when you listen to Cali, you can hear like any any time you listen to your favorite band's first record or their demos, their first EP, you can tell the sound is there and you can see like, oh, this is the direction they were going and the elements are there, but they're not refined in uh, artistic, beautiful sense yet. 
And I think that <laughs> Cali has that. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I think it's like the perfect encapsulation of all the ethos we were just just talking about, you know, um, from its like rugged uh, intentions to its like great confluence of metaphysical ideas that we were having on our own, you know, to bringing together. And I think that brings me to another aspect, you know, because you were talking earlier about how you learned from you know, past projects and past bands. And one thing that, you know, I I want to be like excited and clear to say about this one was like how intentional I was to not treat this as I had past projects where I really was kind of the sole uh, generator of, you know, the song, the recording like all of the above even if other people were in said band it still always fell to me and you know that was a hard lesson to learn because I there were aspects of myself that I didn't like in those situations um, where I wouldn't let go of things or I would obsess and be a bit uh, dictator like about certain aspects and Throughout this entire process, you know, that quote from Buzz Osborne just kept barking in my head. It's like, if you're working with somebody else, like, let them do their thing. Like, why why work with them, you know, at all? If you, they can't just be allowed to, you know, be who they are and work with them. And that really, you know, helped solidify, like, my want to not regress back into, you know, overtly... Um, controlling kind of aspects that I had in my younger, you know, band days and stuff. So to me, this has all been like a, an overarching, like big growth, even as a human being and as a collaborator, <laughs> you know, too. So, yeah. Mm. I'm glad you felt that you were able to implement those things and grow, man. That's Not great. to say that there were any, any time where I was like, no, I don't like this or this isn't good. It was more so an act of like, um, being resolute in what I'm doing and also being resolute in what you're doing. And like, just trusting that there was no point through this entire project where I was like, Oh, I'm not cool with this. Or like, I don't want this. You know what I mean? I just, I mean to say that that was a, a very much like a, an evolution of, of how, collaboration works in this context that is different from you know spare spells or like another past group i had mm -hmm. but yeah yeah it was it was easy to work with you on this i don't feel like either of us got too critical because we both understood what the parameters were you know yeah and that's we both had entered into them voluntarily and i think that that is what kept us having fun which i think is uh, you get lost when you get so serious about music. You forget the point is to be expressive and creative and enjoy it. You get so apart. It's like, it's a message. It's meaningful. I have to like make sure it's, uh, and it's just like, yes, that is part of it, but that's never going to flower and blossom if you choke it to death. Yeah. It's just going to happen, you know? So and, I tried yeah. to not be as critical. I tried to not be critical on you either. There was a couple ones you sent me that I were mm -hmm. like, I was like, uh, I don't feel like this is the sound of the band. And I feel like you can do uh, a better rendition of these ideas for this project. But I was never like, uh, this fucking sucks, dude. You know what I mean? Like, I was always trying to be respectful and kind of be like, I hear what you're doing, but I feel like maybe a different direction would be better, you know? Yeah, there was, yeah, those two instances where even I knew when I sent them was just to kind of show you, you know, hey, I plugged in today and this is what came out. But even I knew it was like a, a shot in the dark. They, they were just so wildly different. And they also, because of variables and even like ritualistic variables, not being heated like the other ones that worked, you know, where I'd be working on a mix of uh, an album of mine, you know, the song sigil series for hours. And then to break away from that, you know, I would use the project um, as a as a means to kind of escape that, but wouldn't shake what I was doing prior, you know, altogether. So it wasn't giving it its its due 
um, as the other ones should. Yeah. And there was two cases where I allowed that to happen and knowing it when I sent it and shared it both times was like, you know, this, this, if he does like this, then it's, I'd be surprised, but at the same time, like, it's also a document of, you know, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm messing around. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think as long as you're, you have to learn to dis, you have to learn to disagree respectfully in mm-hmm. in any kind of, any kind of uh, a marriage, a friendship, any kind of business partnership, any kind of partnership at all. Like you have to like stand your ground and be like, no, I don't think this is right. Or I don't think this is the thing we should do but not be, yo, this fucking sucks. What is this? You know what I mean? Cause like, that's also not productive and that's actually counterproductive. If you say, Hey, I love the fact that you're, you, it's not lying. And it's not manipulative. You just choose to vocalize the more positive and productive parts of your thoughts. That's all yeah. it is. It's not like, it's not a linguistic tactic. It's not like me manipulating you to play something different. It's me saying, Hey man, I do like the fact that you're, thinking outside the box and this is different than the other stuff. I like that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I didn't feel like this one particularly fit the vibe of the band. And when you say that to somebody, they go, okay, I'm not being attacked. Okay. I can change this. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and that's how you have to be. And that's how I'd want you to approach me. If you didn't like the drums, if you were like, Hey man, this rhythm sounds like the other one or, Hey, I am having trouble working with this. Can you send me something different? I'm not like, well, this is what it is, man. Just deal. You know, like, so I think, being able to do that is huge. And for you too, like having the, um, the, I was going to say like the the sigil process, like designing the sigil was not unlike that where it was just, you know, Hey, this isn't hitting me. You know, I like elements of this, but you know, it's just not popping. And like through every process like that, something greater came from it because we were just open and honest about, you know, like, yeah, "Ah, it's just not it. Um, But I dig elements of it, see where that can go, you know? And that's, yeah, that was the beauty. I know this sounds probably really rudimentary uh, for folks that might be listening or in or in bands or in marriages or whatever, but you have to understand like how, how just how elemental that is for two strong willed, two strong headed, creators in disparate places to maintain that connectivity (laughs) when it'd be very easy, you know, just to be like, nah, fuck this or I'm good. And just, you know, or change something and and not give a shit what the other person thinks, you know? Right. I'm a critical, stubborn bastard, dude. Like I really am. So (laughs) I may not seem that way. I might seem super jovial and, you know, satirical a lot of the time and that's great. But on the inside, a lot of the time, I mean, I'm just super critical of my own work because I don't have time to fuck around. So when I mess up a beat, I don't go, hmm, well, what do I do? I go, no, nope, fuck that. That sucked. Do it again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, ha- I have to learn to, over the years, I've had to learn to mediate that. I can't just be that direct with people because they don't see it where I'm coming from. I don't mean it uh, angrily or offensively. It's just so matter to the fact that it just kind of shocks people. So I've had to temper that <laughs> a little bit in order to work with people. And I feel like you know, your mind works somewhat similarly to that too, where you're like, I have an idea. I know this is what I want to do. I want this. This isn't exactly what I'm seeing, you know, and I'm not going to like, we can find, you know, uh, we can find a middle ground, but I'm also not just going to let, you know, my idea go to nothing either, which is great. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we should launch into Haunter, which was uh, the second one. And I think the only pretense we had for this one is that we wanted we, we we were still experimenting with each other. So we wanted to do something not drastically different, but in another aura of atmosphere and to try something, you know, not as uh, quick and and maybe hot headed as Cali 333 came out to be. You know what I mean? But something a bit more. How do I say this? A serpentine, but at the same time, you know, uh, sneaky and something a little bit nefarious in a way, you know, but still overall, I like uh, a, a beautiful, a, you know, a beautiful construction. And I say nefarious by meaning more like mischievous and it's uh, yeah. like overall like- rendition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like the title for this one is very 
uh, apt because it is like one of the most ghostly sounding tracks on the album to me in my in my own view. So. Consciousness is a ghost, a spook, a phantom that somehow spoils the logic of this perfectly balanced clockwork universe, this worldview that we have created for ourselves. That was Haunter, specifically spelled H-A-V-N-T-R, which we should get into as well, was also in the running uh, for a project name. Um, far better suited, I think, for for this track, but yeah, there's there's so much to unpack here. One of them, one element I wanted to also explain, another major contribution of yours was uh, sample selection. Um, whereas like, uh, you know, almost giving you another element uh, to perform in a way outside of, you know, just the, just the drums. So maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, the cachet of samples we use throughout the albums, but specific or throughout the album, but specifically this one, because I, I think the strange angel sample really solidified and molded, uh, this song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that sample is from the show strange angel, which was, a uh, a show like a biopic on a uh, series two season series on, Jack Parsons, who I know we're both, or I think we're both really uh, into and appreciate in the occult sense. I love his work, and I think uh, so many things about that dude were interesting, not just the rocket stuff. Um, and the show I always loved, too, because it just kind of, it kind of re-enchanted me. Every time I got into a lull in life, I'd throw that show back on, and they, like, reignited something in me. Even though I'm not specifically into Thelema or anything like that, necessarily, um, it just got me thinking and i was there were so many good lines in that show that in previous in a previous project we had planned to layer these group of samples that i'd sent you throughout our live performance and kind of make it the cohesive factor in that performance so that one specifically i figured you might gravitate to um <laughs> because it's 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 uplifting 
you know, it's uplifting. And yeah, it's empowering. It's, yeah. She says, I, I think this might be something wrong with me and I need to be fixed. Can you do that? And the Magus, he's of the temple of the Agape Lodge, says, no, because you are not broken. And then she kind of gets enamored with him and the fact that he's, you know, can help her and that she's not unfixable and she always thought she was. And, you know, it's actually uh, a beautiful moment. So I like that we use that one. And the fact that the the music in the background is actually in the same key or whatever, or you made it yeah. in the same key. Really cool. Yeah. And that was one of those like really magical uh, happenstance things because, yeah, you sent me, it was a, uh, like a folder full of Strange Angel samples. And this must have been like the second one I listened to just kind of randomly and was like, oh, this is, this is beautiful. This is perfect. And it's also like a haunting maxim where it doesn't need to be from the show. It's great that it is and how it's performed, but it's also like a, a beautiful lyric in and of itself, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, when I, when I brought it in and was uh, playing with it, like with the guitar, I originally was going to do this whole thing where I put it on cassette tape and I did, and I kind of had it like looping through a loop pedal and then realized that, you know, originally I was probably going to maybe edit out or mix out the strings and orchestral arrangements that are in the sample and realized real quick, like, no, that's an accompaniment. That sounds, it's in the key of the guitar, you know, of, of, the, of the song itself. And it was just one of those beautiful unions where holy yeah we've got a little bit of an orchestral thing going on uh not intentionally but happily so <laughs> you know? yeah it was a, a very serendipitous and synchronous uh occasion for that to work out so well so i appreciate that you dug that one and i appreciate that you you know just the work you did to weave it in there and make it not stand out too much and it, it did sound like it was part of the track you know what i mean already it didn't mm. sound like it was a sample layered over the top or anything like that so it's cool yeah and of course the um the alan moore quote at the end which you know we're both big fans of and you know i've been widely known to uh, sample some of his beautiful bits of <laughs> uh language especially in pragmatic but uh that one just is a perfect encapsulation of i think not only the song but you know, from my escapades into magic and using kind of the vector of a ghost or a specter within hauntomancy and consciousness and temporal time and, and all of that, and having you, you know, find that all ha already and had it kind of like ready and rearing to go somewhere was also another really beautiful communion, you know. And then it, it leads, you know, right when it ends, it leads right into Cali. And there's something special about these two songs together because not only were they the first two uh, that we created, but they also, I think, beautifully illustrate the spectrum of, you know, dynamics, really, or like heavy charge versus like, you know, haunting saunter kind of a thing. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you were always a torchbearer for keeping a serpentine, you know, desert fuzz thing, which I was very thankful for. And we should talk about influences, too, um, whether they were influences that we were aware of or not. But um, mm -hmm. that I think those two songs are like the great, you know, dynamic of that serpentine desert, you know, fuzz yeah when you when you asked like if when you said when you kind of were throwing out i don't want to say genre but uh when you were throwing out adjectives to what the project would kind of direction it would go in you had said you know a desert serpentine doom project and i was like oh you're speaking my language man <laughs> you know yeah yeah saying you know and the, and the other thing i was going to say is that sample of alan i've had that for almost 10 years yeah so it's been waiting to be used. I've used it a couple times live, but I don't think it would have had the same impact with the crowd at the local bars as it would the uh, the group of people that probably pay attention to you and Prague and you know whatever we're working on. So maybe it'll hit a little more closer to home. I've always loved that quote, and it's always been kind of a torch for me to remember that. You know, like that's a great uh, 
that's a great that's what i'm looking for bulwark against you know materialism and nihilistic thought is is to remember that consciousness is a ghost and a spook and a phantom and it doesn't fit into the world view of materialism mm-hmm. well, you know and that was just i always love that about alan's quote and i think those two songs specifically yeah they did set the tone they set the tone and they definitely are the two I wouldn't say they're the complete spectrum because we do go in different directions, but I would say they definitely do um, solidify where it's solidified for me. And I think for you too, where this was going to head and what was going to be, you know, one of your favorite words, like the thoroughfare of where mm-hmm. this was headed. So absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the other aspects I wanted to touch on was, you know, you mentioned, and this was off the cuff, like keeping in mind your drumming oeuvre, like, and the power that you bring with it and an element, you know, working with Hauntomancy and like really kind of, um, I would maybe adapting, but also communing with like kind of lost parts of the self and like, um, childhood whims and wonders, you know, like I was my bread and butter and the desert was the Melvins and Unwound and Fugazi and like very angular, hard, you know, Caius, like very desert born or angular Cascadian, you know, uh, rip roaring um, kind of music. And it's something I've always, always had in me that I've wanted out, but just hadn't quite found the vehicle of which to like co-pilot it with, you know, there, there might be elements here and there with past bands, but it was never able to be exercised until now. And that to me, that was a, a big like bridge and a hauntomantic way of like communing with the specter of the self that like, Hey, you remember you've always wanted to do this band and somehow along, you know, this long and toiled history of life that you've lived so far, it just, you forgot about it or it just hadn't been able to materialize in any way. And then here you are. And it was like, it just made perfect sense. And so it got to exercise, you know, a part of me that long wished uh, would be able to just fuzz the fuck out, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, man. uh, Yeah. I don't know what else to say. I agree. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I think you share that in one degree, and I wrote a little bit about this in the draft of the hyper sigil thing that I posted on Patreon, especially uh, specifically about Dim Zoom and how I'm reticent to ever term the magic you put into this as hauntomantic or whatever. But one element you did say that I think sings to that is that you had these rhythms or like a, the cachet of them uh, in whatever mutation or form, like in your tool belt forever. Um, mm-hmm. And you finally found a vehicle to like exercise these or like let these things go and live, you know, in, in some other ethereal space so that you could, you know, construct a new era of self, you know? Yeah. And like, I think that's the other like confluence is that we both got to, you know, commune with aspects of ourselves and, and give it the proper vehicle or urn, you know, <laughs> to uh, house its ashes if we're burning them down or building them up or, you know, it's just like we, we gave it a talismanic life, you know, both of these. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of Haunter specifically, the rhythm in that song, at least the, the one that it starts with, that it shuffles back and forth through because there's two. Um, I wrote when my drums were in the basement of one of my students, Dan, when I was in between living spaces and I'd have to drive 40 minutes out to Woodstock, Illinois, where he lives to play drums Um, because I couldn't have him at my dad's house where I was staying temporarily until I got this place. And I wrote that rhythm down there by myself in this open field with a horse ranch in the back and this beautiful pine log cabin house in the basement. And then i don't know if you noticed this i was going to tell you but if you go back to my instagram and you look at the uh eclipse waltz video i did right after the last eclipse that's this rhythm that's hilarious yeah so i've been trying to let it come out in different ways and i've decided to retire some of these rhythms i've had forever that i that i would go to when jamming or that i would try to find a way to fix them into a project 
one way or another, I finally was like, these are my favorite ones and I'm going to put them into this because it deserves, you know, the best or the most creative that I can offer. And I also want to get better at drums. So now I have to, I have to expand my creative mind and I have to expand my ability to play because it's not that these were so technical that they were the best I could do. It's that they were a blend of creativity and technicality that pleased me. And now I have to up that. So absolutely. Yeah. But I love that, uh, that other shared, uh, eclipse idea. Cause you know, that they have like really formed, uh, the basis of a lot of the hump hauntomancy stuff and like my own personal praxis. So it's beautiful that that is a tether as well. That's really cool. I didn't know that. And I've definitely made a note to make mention of that, <laughs> you know, moving forward. Cause that's really cool. Go watch the video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the other cool thing is that uh, because of your large library of, you know, footage of you playing really rad, amazing rhythms, uh, a lot of people can probably find the genesis of a lot of these songs, like on your Instagram, Transplutonic uh, yeah. in- Instagram. So that's that's really cool, too, is that, you know, as a documentarian, you know, adjacent creator myself, I, I think that's really cool. You can you can witness the tethers of these things pretty early on yeah there's at least two of them if not if not more you know what i mean there's definitely a few of them up there that you can see where the seed idea is and yeah it's really what i bring man i really just bring this i try to get as shamanic as i can with it without trying to sound pretentious or anything like that like i really do try to get into that altered state when I write and or perform because especially in in this room for this project specifically is like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to just play drums and call it magic for me. That's right. Anybody can play drums and it's not just magic. You know what I mean? Like, and I know, you know, I do agree with you that creating art is a magical act, but I also think that intention is really important yeah. as well. Absolutely. So, I, yeah. Whenever I say that it's to kind of lesser the, uh, you know, maybe a mis- the mysterium stigma of, of magic to, you know, uh, uber scientific or pragmatist type people. Sure. Um, but what I, yeah, what I truly mean and with my thing, and actually, I, you know, was writing a lot about this today about what constitutes a hyper sigil, why this is a hyper sigil from me and this isn't, why, you know, this is, is different or like, and it's all just intention heavy. It's, it's the minutia is all intention heavy. Everything is, is, is a ritualized art and artifact of the creator at this moment in time, you know, projecting a prospector of, of what could be or what maybe is, you know? And so like, yeah, I'm very resolute as well into being discernible about why this is magical and not just saying, you know, in the, flighty kind of flippant way like us creating together was magic you know what i mean that's that's not what i mean even though there is truth to that it's i mean very much to discern that there are some heavy magics within this shit you know yeah there were synchronicities that happened throughout and i think that once you start getting into the flickering glimmering of synchronicity you're starting to get back into that world of enchantment and the the logical mind the analytical material mind will always try to rationalize it away but if you Mm -hmm. acknowledge feeling and if you acknowledge that it's kind of impossible for it to be um just chance you know that i I, us us meeting each other us getting along us having these different tethers in different ways to each other and liking the same things and wanting to play the same kind of project and all that stuff is it isn't necessarily magical, but it's it's synchronous and it's serendipitous and it's definitely yeah. enchanting. You know, there's something outside of just roll the dice, numerical chance that I believe that we're jamming. You know what I mean? That's my and I use jamming as a loose term, but, um, you know, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. I don't believe that it's all chaos theory and it's all just you know right. rolling the dice and you're just a clock counting down like what a what a sad way in my opinion, to look at life, like you don't have any agency and you're just going to end up wherever you were going to end up in the first place. Like I don't buy into that. And even if it is true and I'm just too stupid of a monkey to understand that I will never capitulate to that because I, it kills the spirit and I don't want my spirit to be killed. So absolutely. It, yeah. In saying 
what I mean is, is that this whole thing has been serendip- uh, enchanting for me. Mm-hmm. And I don't, like I said, I don't just want to hit drums and call it magic. I want to actually sit behind the kit, have an intention, get into that meditative space, just like I do when I perform my rituals in my actual temple, just like I do when I perform a group ritual, just like all these things I've been doing for years. And I am nowhere near a depth hood or depth ship, whatever you want to call it. But just the intention behind it is 100% as important you can you can stand in a room and recite the lbrp but it doesn't really fucking matter if you don't get in your mind into the zone and actually banish the energies and actually have an effect on yourself yeah absolutely so it's always been so important to me uh to document the minutia and the aspects of this because yeah it's real easy to hide behind the mysterium of just calling an album a hyper sigil and then allowing that to just have its own egregore or its own like people to put their own meaning or what what could this mean? But to me, it's always been really important to be like, why? Why is this high procedural? Like, what constitutes this as such? And like, how exciting it, it is in that like uh, Raina Maria Rilke like letters to a young poet way of like showing how one does one, how one creates one. I think that's like the most opportune lesson to be taught is just by doing it. Right. And then like showing, even though it might be personal and they're not like, you know, scientific um, experiments in the same way that you can replicate them and have the same results or anything. It's more of an inspo punching uh, way of like, this is how I got into the rhythms to create this thing. This is why it bled through every aspect of my life. This is why it's a document of every aspect of my life from my fingers to my toes, you know, my thoughts and my nose, that sort of shit. So like, it's, it's, yeah, it's always been really important to me uh, to showcase that minutia. And I think that's exactly why I was excited for you and I to talk about this shit because, you know, maybe on the surface it might seem a bit, um, I don't know, frivolous or like uh, maybe explaining, too much not letting the art speak for itself it's like no there's there's an imaginarium where the art does speak for itself and we speak through the art but at the same time like it's incredible to like reflect and remark on on how these things you know are consorted and like the elements that create such a such a beast you know Mm -hmm. yeah and like just the fact that i discovered prag magic and you found your work and then was able to make a connection with you. And then that's what I'm talking about. Like, to me, that's the lore. That's the magic. Like, that's what I want to know, how my favorite artists, like, what's the creepy shit that happened to them that made, you know, what's the synchronicities that happened to them that, like, they're that shows you the tethers of how they met the people in their life. And then they, those people affected them. And that's how this art was created. Like, that's super interesting to me. It's not that we're crazily interesting people, although I mean, I would that you're definitely more interesting than me because I'm just like a dude. But like you, you're yeah. definitely making like you're making creative stuff all the time, and I'm always amazed by your prolific prolificness uh, and keeping yourself busy all the time. And I, I aspire to be like that. But it's a good I way find, to put it: keeping myself busy. Yeah, <laughs> that's essentially what it maybe is. Maybe you're you just know? maybe you're just interesting to me. But regardless, <laughs> um. I love that. And I want people to hear this album to know that like, we're not just like, Hey, yeah, we're, we're making magic. Everything's a ritual. Check it right. out. No, no, no. Like there's, there's a deeper story here that's happening that we're both sometimes aware of and sometimes not aware of. And we're becoming more aware of it as it happens. And that this is kind of a synchronous event that's playing out. And we're kind of documenting that this is a synchronous enchanted event that's playing out and it shows itself in the music. And is that, you know, a little too on the nose maybe a little bit because we're like telling you like yeah we're doing this thing it's like maybe a little bit but it's also the beginning of this project you know what i mean and it's right. also we're also super excited about it so when you're super excited about something you're going to be very into it and, well and like yeah it's part and parcel of pra- of prag magic and what you know that element has always meant for me um was to kind of showcase that you know this is how one does this and you can too and i think you know it's beautiful that uh we there's a nexus point of because of technology 
you know, we were allowed to do some things, but it's also like very intrinsic to, you know, our experiences separately and like how, how we approached it outside of just being able to do this transcontinentally or whatever, you know? And I just want, I hope that like more people do instead of pontificate or like, uh, I, I like that too. I love that too. But, uh, yeah, I want I want to I want to live in a world where there's more art being created, you know, from the ground up and and treated with reverence and excitement and uh relishing in the, you know, absurdity of how the how things come together. Uh yeah, rather than not living in that world, right? <laughs> so but well, I think uh a good example of that uh, coming together and like those kind of synchronicities would be how interzoom or interzoom uh, came to be, which is basically like the interlude of the record, uh, which really uh, surrounds your tongue drum uh, melody that you played and what came from that and how we took that and went completely not against uh, very parallel, but we deconstructed what we were doing and found another way to it. Now it's recording. the kind of centerpiece or the palate cleanser of side A and side B, if you will, of, of the record is this phenomenal uh, audio sigil, like for all intents and purposes, uh, between more than just us magicians, but also featuring Vanessa Sinclair, uh, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and some of Carl Abrahamson, uh, two brilliant and incredibly storied mages in their own rights uh, who she provided, you know, uh, recordings of her reading never before released, um, some of her cut-ups. Uh, what you hear is her basically kind of reading the same thing, but two different takes that I compiled into kind of a spectrum and had them, you know, dance with each other and kind of cut up a bit um, towards the end, but yeah. And that to me is, uh, is pretty amazing that, uh, you know, not only that they would grace us with, you know, some of their original work, but that, uh, that came together kind of as a lark because Dr. Sinclair had heard the, uh, Revel Ross song sigil, many names that I had just put out and, she was like, hey, we should do something together. Um, I'm going to send you some recordings. And I was like, that's great. And then I 
I don't think I ever got the email or it got lost in like spam or something. And I didn't think much to it. And it wasn't until, you know, we were kind of finalizing the record and knew we needed some tether to it that I remembered that, holy shit, uh, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair was going to send me some stuff. I have just the thing. And so I sent her a rough, uh, you know, mix of your tongue drum and my, and me playing the spirit box, uh, you know, from the cassette tape of our session. Uh, and she's like, Oh yeah, this is going to be great. And then I just kind of had carte blanche to take what she sent me and created this thing. So talk about a magical artifact. Like this song in and of itself is a, is a heavy charge for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And it's a little, uh, what was the word I used? It was a little surreal for me, too, because I don't know if you remember this, but the way I found you and found Prague was looking up Carl Abrahamson interviews. And that's pretty funny to me that yeah, uh, within, you know, not even a year later or, you know, whatever, maybe a year later, uh, playing on an album, you know, or whatever, I'm playing on a, you know, a release that features uh both of their their voices and their words on there i know big carl being like uh you know now it's recording and then we just mm -hmm. go into it it's really it's really awesome you know and uh, all and that was great. vanessa vanessa's um yeah just every little piece of that was great like i love how you doubled up and dual you know or dual tracked some of the vocals so they were like well those are two different takes yeah of her yeah. those are like two different atmospheres where she's reading the same thing and and I think she sent me these as like takes. So like Carl's voice in there, what it wasn't necessarily meant to be included. Uh, they both say this is recording as kind of a marker. And I was like, no, I'm using that. You know, that's, that's perfect. That's a beautiful like entryway into this. And like what she says, you know, lyrically, um, you know, whether they're lyrics or not, or cut ups or, or you know, her writing, um, I think perfectly encapsulates that like atmosphere of this uh, dim desert between us that we were, you know, transmitting and creating and, and that sort of lore. And honestly, I had either forgotten or just didn't remember that uh, Carl was a genesis of us, genesis, uh, pun intended, but uh, of meeting, you know, of you finding me and another beautiful synchronicity that, uh, he would and they would appear on this thing. That's crazy. I, I didn't connect the dots when, you know, <laughs> no, I consorted yeah. them. That's why I said it was surreal for me because that, I remember reading Source Magic and I remember reading A Culture and I have a bunch of the Fenris Wolf books. And I was last spring or summer, I was just listening to all the interviews I could get by him just on everything, just listening to all the Source Magic because he had just put that book out. And then I was looking for interviews and I found your channel and that's just how mm -hmm. it all started, man. So I think that that's why I said it was surreal. Cause you know, <laughs> and to see him post repost it on Instagram was just like, you know, it's not, it's just cool. It's just like, not even that like he's a celebrity or anything. It's just really yeah. cool to be like a person whose work I was influenced by and reading and was lives in Sweden or wherever they live. And it's like mm -hmm. to, somehow then get in touch with you and then somehow you were on good terms with them and then they wanted to collect it's just it's insane like if that's not synchronicity man i don't know what to tell you it is you know yeah no that's uh that all worked out beautifully and they too are some of the you know few um modern uh, cultural people that I just like relish and adore and love everything that they do and stand for and create and, and hum with. And after years of, you know, doing the podcast and meeting folks like they are two that, you know, they were just on the Honquinox last year, the, we, the hollowed thing, like they're, they're two that I still fervently keep in contact with and, you know, keep up to date with their own creations. I just, I, I adore their entire, like, uh, drive and um, like fervent nature when it comes to creativity and and magic and writing and and music and all sorts of uh, they're transmedium you know creators so 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's funny. So in a way, too, it was uh, there was a part of me that was giving some like reverence, you know, to them. And I just think it's funny that on a whim, I just, you know, I recalled that like it wasn't too long ago, like literally maybe within the month that she mentioned she was going to send me things for a potential, you know, musical collab. And mm-hmm. yep. uh, thank the gods that they dug it, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> And they are the type of people who would get it for sure, full stop. You know, so right. Well, that's another. That's yeah. another interesting uh, and beautiful connection there that I'm glad we made, and the music had an effect on them. You know, I, I like to think that they, you know, uh, genuinely enjoyed it or genuinely found some value in it because that that's great. Yeah, man. Um, I think uh, what I loved about this one too. Not only did it kind of split this 13 minutes and 33 second you know huge combustible like heavy magical thing it also like introduces the second half and i think in a way the second half of the piece is more um descriptive of what we are like the mode we are currently working within in a way you know like between falter and and low it seems like that like the almost the album's laid out in sort of a progression you know of like what we started from even though it's a little jumbled in the first half but you know those were early ones into later and by later i mean what the same month you know it's like not much but it shows like the the progression of like what we were experimenting with and kind of going into and and doing so I think that's really cool that they kind of set the tone for that, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But I did want to uh, just to jump into Falter, which I think is, it's, it's just grew to be, I don't know, it grew to be uh, my favorite. And it's also where I started really experimenting because this, this next track, and we'll talk a little bit about it more, but I customized a guitar for it, basically. Um which wasn't yeah. working it was defunct and i got off my ass and decided to create a talisman for this song uh, an instrumental one and that became the basis for it and this one i think continues to grow as a per- like a personal favorite of mine but a yeah it's a, it's a grower for sure forgive the term <laughs> <laughs> i've said <had> it before <laughs> space Endless space.
some cosmic influence previously unknown is coming through from beyond the normal tree of life. All right, yeah, and we should talk about the Paul Weston uh, sample too at the end uh, because that's another magnanimous, like magically, we just inserted, you know, long story, great folks in the things and kind of continued a relationship with them, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, well, yeah, we could touch on the the Paul thing. Uh, he. I love his work in general. You know what I mean? I really, I have a uh, Alistair Crowley and the Aeon of Horus, which is a hard book to find. It's expensive. He's going to reprint it apparently, but uh, listen to all his interviews and just, he's one of those people who really got me even more into Kenneth Grant, which I know we're both into even more than I was. And he's got a reverence for that stuff. And he's very into synchro mysticism as well. And I love that. So having him, I was listening to an interview. I can't remember which one, and that little snippet at the end popped out to me as something we might be able to use because it did have to do with the new Isis Lodge. And like I talked about before, Kenneth Grant, who was a personal magical hero of mine, and um, just how it was representative of you know this new thing being brought forward from somewhere that isn't standard, isn't normal, you know. And I feel like we we're kind of doing that, so we're trying to. Yeah, no, it was beautiful, and obviously our you know, Kenneth Grant shows not only in like the, um, Quran's on kind of serpentine aspects of the project in and of itself, but your Mauve room, it being called the Mauve sessions, you know, which is also, um, a general play on Kenneth Grant, but also giving credence to your element with the dim, you know, part of the dim zoom element. And I think that was like a good, you know, whole together. So yeah, that was another piece that fit the puzzle. I did want to talk about just to nerd out a little bit, but uh, Mary had gotten me this guitar as a project guitar, I think for my birthday. Um, I've always wanted like a Mustang, but I always had the intention of putting a Bigsby bridge on it. And uh, you know, it's just a cheap guitar that I had. Um, call it the uh, Resonar guitar. It's, uh, you know, really cheap guitar that I, you know, put literally blood is on it from cutting myself, uh, installing this fucking <laughs> Bigsby bridge on it, which is Holy absurd. Um, and wow. that is the guitar you hear on Falter. And it was in pieces um, because... Yeah, I was fucking myself up installing this, and it was, you know, oh yeah, I'm using stuff to like lift the uh, the bridge a bit, but it was in pieces. It was tattered, and this song gave me the impetus to finish this project and be like, no, I, in my mind, I have, you know, something for this song, and it all it all started from this. So like this talisman literally was kind of created uh, through Dim Zoom, and outside of this, you know, uh, being created, like most of the guitar you hear is of course the, uh, good old ectogasm where I'm allowed to really fuzz it out. And that's the, the baritone electric that is prominent in pretty much all of my stuff, but never heard like this really before, you know? So between these two very intentional and kind of intrinsic talismanic instruments you know that's that's where a lot of the guitar comes from mm -hmm. beautiful oh as they break one watch um but oh, shit. but yeah it's it's just interest, interesting to me that uh, in, a, in a magical way you know blood was shed um there there was construction uh in a somatic way of creating tools and talismans to create the music you know so that's that's just a it's a personally a, a really cool element that I just wanted to share about it. Yeah, I never you know I knew that, but I guess I never knew how you that you assembled it. I thought it was just an old guitar that you kind of put the Bigsby on, and now mm -hmm. I realize that's awesome. That's beautiful that you created that specifically for the project and for that song. And you know, I specifically created that beat that you hear throughout that song. Yeah. Um, for it too. I mean, all of them, but like I specifically was playing around with this idea of 
uh, five, like accenting the first three notes of a pattern of five. One, two, three, one, two, mm-hmm. three. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And that's the kick pattern. That's the pattern underneath of that beat and here that over the top. So it's very much polyrhythmic in an odd time signature, which I thought was, you could follow it. So it wasn't like you, you wouldn't get lost, but at the same time it was hypnotizing and memor- mesmerizing a little bit because it was not, it wasn't as predictable as some other beats might be. Which I liked. What I loved about it is it allowed me to like create a sinew where I could either follow that to the T or like imprint, you know, another kind of even a four four time signature that can weave into it so like it, it opened a room because it was uh you know it was subliminal in its way of a time signature you know which is really mm-hmm. cool and i love that and i hope uh the more we create the more we experiment too with just the maths of it i know there was experimentation of that but um that would be a really cool element to to really share in you know mm-hmm. I love how you matched my bell tone on the little whatever chorus or whatever that is the the actual bell hits on the ride because there's a certain yeah. note hits and your guitar matches that note and I feel like them singing together and that bell being so pronounced in the song it being almost like an added layer of melody really mm-hmm. made it cohesive. But that's one of those reasons where at first that song it was going to be another one of those things where I was like uh, I don't know and then I really kind of was like let me listen to this again because I feel like there's something here and I kept listening to it. And like we said, it's a grower. Like every time I listen to it, it gets more and more, I get more and more enveloped in it and I find it to be more and more interesting and uh, enjoyable every listen. So, Yeah. Funnily enough, you know, on the surface, I think it's the most straightforward song, but if you really start to unpack it, there's nothing really straightforward about it. You know, mm-hmm. you, yeah. even like the vocals, like I was playing with like a, a, I remember like tuning into this idea of like, like a true chaotic, like drunk magic and like wearing, you know, addiction as like a character. And so there's a, there's a part in the song where he, like the, the narrator switches into like a, you know, and that's like almost like he's giving from the cuff, like talking about, um, you know, uh, mental disfluencies and, you know, conversations hard, companies tough, you know, and just like, doesn't give a fuck about it in a way. And that was all like kind of off the cuff, but I immediately knew that I was kind of messing with like a narrative structure and, and like character and how to, you know, expel that vocally. And it was, yeah, it was just fun. And it was, it was a weird idea and it was just something again, like channeled that I kept to it when I kind of refined it. So. Yeah. yeah. I I think the title of that song too really helps. Yes. Yeah. And that's another thing too. I like to focus on is like, I've always been a person who likes to name songs before I write them because Mm. of this, the title gives you a direction and allows you to um yeah kind of paint a picture as you go with a with with a little bit of a scaffolding you know it's not a tight it's not a tight constriction but it's like a direction for you to go so i I find that that scaffolding really helps me create because otherwise it's just kind of where do i start is this good i don't know how to measure this against anything in terms of you know um is it actually succeeding in being, you know, uh, useful? So that really helps. Yeah, I think I, I like to think of it because I'm a big title person myself, but I think of it in the context of like a filing cabinet of ideas. Like I, I just have a barrage of ideas and the way I can quickly, you know, encapsulate those ideas or have like have a quick messenger service of them is file them under certain titles, you know? And like that title in it of itself encapsulates like the whole thought train of like what I meant by going down, you know, this avenue. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a magical aspect of uh, memory and, you know, ideas and giving like names to the egregore of like ideas, right. Mm -hmm. Before they're fleshed out. I mean, um, Granted, it's, you know, song by song. Some things like uh, 
maybe start out that way and then you just kind of allow the you know genealogy of the muse to bend it ever which way but yeah a lot of times i will start by filing an idea or like a inspiration as as a title so that's what was fun about this exercise with you kind of bringing the genealogy of titles into it and then me allowing to kind of like you know bend them or kind of uh yeah mutate them but have that genealogy still there you know what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah but yeah man um i know we've got uh we started with bellows uh for those that are, are watching this that's this the this the intro of the to the album is the intro to this episode and um in a beautiful kind of circular way um, it's also the reprise of the end of Alas and Low, which to me, you know, perfectly exemplifies that the, the ritual is never done. Uh, time is a flat circle. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> totally. No, it's beautiful. Uh, man. It's, uh, I think when you tie a concept together and begin it and end it with an echo back and forth like that, it does mm-hmm. make it cohesive in that way. It makes it a solid uh, a, it's a singular expression that has chapters, and I think that that is uh, it lends itself to being absorbed and processed by the mind and the soul a little bit more easily than having to, you know, swim your way through and try to aggregate all these things. You kind of understand, like, okay, this whole thing takes place within these bookends. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I like that. Yeah, and that's like elemental to what i mean by calling something a sigil whether it be you know an album or or you know video art or whatever it's like the intrinsic processes and tethering them all together like all the minutiae as well and getting into the weeds like you know we thought long and hard about song structure and how bellows was you know definitely the the circle drawing kind of liminal right into the thing and how interesting we needed something as you know the kind of powers kind of mutate and focus and then you know the yeah just kind of the raucous nature of of a ritual in it in and of itself but at the same time calling back closing the circle is opening the circle at the same time it's that like you know Invo evocation, like what's the difference, you know, kind of thing, like yeah. made whole. Yeah. It is almost like a ritual cycle in itself. And I think that mm-hmm. that is, a, it was, that actually wasn't intentional, you know, but it was definitely um, purposeful at the end when we were like, okay, maybe we should reprise, you know, we were calling it Glissades for a while, Ghost Glissades, mm-hmm. which is a cool title, but we ended up going with, you know, bellows and uh, alas and low because alas is, is was a separate song in itself, and then um, to ha- to add that reprise at the end, I think tied it together and you know or tethered it together in a very beautiful fashion. That it did feel to me like the the opening and closing of uh, of, a, of a right. So I appreciate mm-hmm. that a lot. Yeah, and there was a part of me that always knew that it would be the elements or like the you know schematics of of a ritual in in an artistic way but they really fell into place uh quite naturally like just through the product of us you know of like you um not wanting something different in how you perform bellows and i was like well let's let's keep bellows but give me how you would update that and we'll turn that into something else you know so it was all very like natural it was it was very much like oh shit yeah we should make this a a repre or a reprise you know and have it revolve it was it was never yeah it was never like pretentious in the sense that like and here's a liminal right and here's you know like (laughs) that was all i think uh understood like automatically understood that that's that's kind of how this was unfolding you know yeah and you uh you never added that tambourine did you uh, nope, didn't. Got away. <laughs> yeah, I realized I that a few days ago. I realized that a few days ago. I'm like, damn it, you got me. <laughs> no, I know. I remember. I like. I remember it was on on my mind, but um, yeah, it was something that I was like, oh, I guess it just didn't 
like that element didn't charge heavy enough for both of us to to care for that idea to be expelled. But it's something yeah. that I always kind of intended to do. It's just, you know, got lost in the tundra. And that is like the beautiful um like fallibility of creating something like this quickly and honestly. It's like, you know, to kind of uh ingress with regret and like commune with that like oh, i wish i would have mixed the vocals a little bit lower on bellows you know but like that's the beauty this isn't the end of that song this isn't the ultimate um version of anything other than an encapsulation of time or like the genesis of a of a shared idea you know like we we are free no, i do the fuck we want moving forward and to change things and reprise things and add things. And maybe in a way, like the reprise of Bellows at the end of Alas and Low is that opener of us saying, hey, we can, you know, these will, these will come back if we want them to be coming back, you know? Mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. yeah. I, I dig that a lot. And hopefully, you know, like you said, this will not only haunt on for both of us, I, I know it will, but I also like the fact that hopefully some more artists who are metaphysically minded click in on it and go, wow, okay, this inspires me in this way, or wow, you know, I, maybe I should start that project with that person I've been talking to, you know, who lives wherever, or just, you know, like your favorite, you know, inspo punch, like to really, mm -hmm. uh, really inspire somebody to do something that they may be thinking about or that they've been wanting to do. Cause that's kind of how it was for you. You've been, you were wanting to do a project like this for a long time and you kind of went down mm -hmm. other avenues and kind of put it on the shelf and almost forgot the shelf existed for a while. And then, mm -hmm. you know, just the, just the synchronicity of me bumping into you and stuff like that. So hopefully others use this as a, you know, I don't know if talisman is the right word, but they use it as some sort of uh, productive, uh, instigator or something yeah. yeah yeah right force a productive force in their life because mm -hmm. that's the whole point of it is to get you in that i think it, it puts me in a magical mind state when i listen to it and i think that that should be the goal you know what i mean it should take you out of mundanity or whatever the word is mundaneness of life mm -hmm. and put you to that magic that literally magical thinking space to where everything has that little glimmer again and then you can start like oh yeah i want to be like i want to do this thing you know like so yeah i don't know if that I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. It makes perfect sense. And I think just to add on to that, that, you know, just because uh, you're connected with somebody, you know, across the country or wherever in the world, like, doesn't, and like you want to collaborate, doesn't mean it just should just, you know, the computer should end all be all. It doesn't mean that, you know, you can't infuse a collaboration with like heavy somatic intention and performance and share ability communion with that person in two very disparate places. You know, like it doesn't mean that, you know, these these communions uh, need to just exist online. They could live in your house, you know, by you actually putting some somatic charge into works and things and people should be excited about that because it is exciting you know 100 percent. and i think if you make the digital aspect the plumbing and the tool like i talked before and it's not mm -hmm. it's not the basis of your creation it's simply you know it's like using the mail you know what i mean like if it's something like that then you still have a reverence for your space and your time and your creativity and that becomes the focus and then it's just the the digital aspect of it is simply just the necessary the mechanism production. yeah yeah it's a mechanism and i think if you focus on that then you're going to start tapping into these realms that you and i have slowly started to you know just kind of open the door slightly on and get some of the the cold air inside from the other world you know yeah and again you know this is definitely a shot across the bow uh, or bow of uh you know a reformation of we the hollowed and like the injection that you know a community of artists like we the hollowed needed and working with eric millar you and i and kind of reformatting a you know forgive the drama but like a, a, the new aeon right of of we the hallowed and what that means is like a a publishing house and as a collaborative effort but also a hub of 
you know, individual artists uh, sharing and connecting, uh, no matter where they are in the world, I think is like the perfect uh, continuation or prospector of this sort of work. And it's become emblematic, almost talismanic of moving forward. Like we are not confined to the boxes in front of us. Like we're going to charge shit as hard um, and as somatic as possible, even if we need to rely on the boxes in front of us, you know, mm-hmm. right on. Yeah, man. Well, I'm going to, you know, we're going to close out with alas and low. Um, Beautiful. and yeah, man, I'm excited for what's, what's to come. And I could talk about this shit all day. It's incredible. <laughs> I, I, I learned a lot, uh, from this and, uh, spooky wise, you know, some spooky synchronicities, uh, really cool ones. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. And I appreciate this project. It came out of fucking nowhere and it's become a great, uh, inspo punch for sure yes. i appreciate the project and i appreciate you too as well my friend so let's let's haunt on and let's uh let's make sure we keep this thing rolling and we make a platform for all these other artists who who may not even know we exist yet but we will bump into down the road amen to that and a very mighty haunt on There are.